All right, we are in 1 Corinthians. Uh, I know I promised you guys, uh, it wasn't really a promise, but said that we were going to go through four chapters, and you were all excitedly looking forward to reading four chapters all at once, but actually I decided to break it up. So, I know, so disappointing. We're just going to do the first two. Paul, called by the will of God to be an apostle of Christ Jesus and our brother Sosthenes, to the church of God that is in Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints together with all those who, in every place, call upon the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, both their Lord and ours. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I give thanks to my God always for you because of the grace of God that was given you in Christ Jesus, that in every way you were enriched in him in all speech and all knowledge even as the testimony about Christ was confirmed among you, so that you are not lacking in any gift as you wait for the revealing of our Lord Jesus Christ, who will sustain you to the end, guiltless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful by whom you were called into the fellowship of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. I appeal to you, brothers, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be united in the same mind and the same judgment. For it has been reported to me by Chloe's people that there is quarreling among you, my brothers. What I mean is that each one of you says, I follow Paul, or I follow Apollos, or I follow Cephas, or I follow Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? I thank God that I baptized none of you except Crispus and Gaius so that no one may say that you were baptized in my name. I did baptize also the household of Stephanus. Beyond that, I do not know whether I baptized anyone else. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, and not with words of eloquent wisdom, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. For the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved it is the power of God, For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God the world did not know God through wisdom, it pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. For Jews demand signs and Greeks seek wisdom, But we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and folly to Gentiles. But to those who are called both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than man, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. For consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. And because of him you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness and sanctification and redemption, so that it is written, Let the one who boasts, boasts in the Lord. And I, when I came to you, brothers, did not come proclaiming to you the testimony of God with lofty speech or wisdom. For I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and much trembling. And my speech and my message were not in plausible words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power so that your faith may not rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Yet among the mature we do impart wisdom, although it is not a wisdom of this age or of the rulers of this age who are doomed to pass away. But we impart a secret and hidden wisdom of God, which God decreed before the ages for our glory. None of the rulers of this age understood this, for if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory." But as it is written, with no eye has what no eye has seen, nor ear heard, nor the heart of man imagined, what God has prepared for those who love him. These things God has revealed to us through the Spirit. For the Spirit searches everything, 
even the depths of God. For who knows a person's thoughts except the spirit of that person which is in him? So also no one comprehends the thoughts of God except the spirit of God. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, that we might understand the things freely given us by God. And we impart this in words not taught by human wisdom, but taught by the Spirit, interpreting spiritual truths to those who are spiritual. The natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are folly to him, and he is not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. The spiritual person judges all things, but is himself to be judged by no one. For who has understood the mind of the Lord so as to instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. Uh, There's a lot here, and I'm not going to address everything here because he's beginning an argument in chapter 1 that he's not going to end until chapter 4. So that larger argument that basically there are divisions and why there are divisions, um, I'm going to put on hold until next time. Um, But in arguing partly why there are divisions, it's due to the fact that you have some people who have lifted up philosophy, the wisdom of the world, the wisdom of experience, that sort of thing, to such a degree that now they're like, well, I like what this guy says because he kind of fits what you know I think and whatnot. Um, and well, I like this guy because he gets really deep in the philosophy and, and you know this this speculation and all that sort of thing. And so it, it's being drawn away toward people because they sound deeper than maybe other teachers sound. Um, is anyone familiar with the Sophists as a group in uh, ancient Greece? Drake, you're, you're nodding your head. What's a Sophist? Pleasure comes from having like a, a some of this and some of that. So like having a, a, a balanced, um, like not being pleasure doesn't come from having an excess of things. It comes from having a moderation of things. Um, I think you're thinking of Epicurus. So Epicureans are that you, you are right, and and that's going to play a role in the, the letter as well. Right. Sophists are actually people who are kind of like the ancient uh, relativists. And so you don't persuade people by something virtu- being true virtually, you know, true within itself. You persuade people through rhetoric. So you, you actually bring people to a position through <clears throat> how you speak about it with your words. So they're all about persuasion. They used to go from place to place and they would charge people money, teaching them how to persuade people. Because ultimately, it didn't matter what the truth was. It just mattered since there was no absolute truth, or at least we couldn't know it. What really mattered is that you persuade people to your opinion through whatever means possible, even, even not, not necessarily even using logic, just using whatever rhetoric you possibly can to convince the people of a particular position. Does that sound familiar to you? That's what the left does. Um, a lot. Because ultimately the left is really, they're they're relativists. So all that's left is not truth to to discover, it's you make the truth, persuade people to an opinion that you want them to believe. Um, I I thought a good example of this, and I don't mean to bring politics into it all, you may like Trump, you may hate Trump, whatever it may be, but the media convinced our culture that Trump was a racist just by how they talked about him and calling him that over and over again. But whenever you had someone say, well, what are you connecting that to? Like, what, what did he say? Um, there's a couple things they'd connected to. Like, you know, he said something about, like, uh, like MS-13 coming over the border, and suddenly that was made like he was saying about all Mexican people about the border, when it was clearly about, like, human traffickers and, and cartels and things like that. It had nothing to do with all people. But for the most part, everyone just kind of like, well, I, I can't really connect it to anything he said. I just have, I generally feel like he is. And I almost feel like all of us generally feel like he is. But, but why? See, the, it, the way you talk about it, you can persuade people, whether you're honest about what you're saying or not, whether you're using logic or facts, it doesn't matter. You can make people believe something 
by the way you talk about it. So there are these people who basically think, um, you know, it, it's it, the person who presents the gospel the best is the person who can persuade the best. And what Paul wants to say is, actually, you've misunderstood. The gospel is not about persuading anyone. God, through the Holy Spirit, has to, in his power, bring someone to the truth of the gospel and the truth of Christianity. That's why he ends this uh, chapter 2 by saying, it is spiritually discerned. These are the things of the Spirit of God. They are the things of power. They cannot be arrived at through reason, through rhetoric, through any other means. And that's why relying on human wisdom to try to persuade people is not the avenue of preaching the gospel. Now, all of us, is everybody familiar with the seeker-sensitive movement? What, what do we mean by we, when we talk about seeker-sensitive ideology? What, what, is, what is it to be seeker-sensitive? Because you believe what? Because you believe that you ultimately have the power to influence whether or not people come to Christ through your actions and your message. Right. People believe the gospel by how much I can persuade them to believe it. And if I can just cut out stuff that's really offensive to them, I can bring them to Christ. Um... That ideology is not just in a seeker-sensitive church. I've seen it in our church. Oh, if you had said this this way, that person wouldn't have run away. If you would have just had this particular tone instead of this one, they would have received that truth. And what Paul wants to communicate to the Corinthians is that no one receives the truth of God without the Spirit of God. No one's going to stop the person from receiving the truth of God if the Spirit of God through power is putting it into him. But the reverse is also true. No one's going to persuade that guy to be regenerate when he's not regenerate. No one's going to persuade him to believe things that only the regenerate can believe if the Spirit of God does not transform him. It's not through your persuasive words. It's not how nice you are or mean you are. It's not how, uh, you know, you, uh, you give everybody a, a, a dinner or something and you try to persuade them to come to Christ that way. I, I, I was just, you know, on Facebook, I'm in this uh, reform marriage group <laughs> on Facebook, uh, which is filled with people who are not reformed in any way. Um, and, and even people who are not believers. And uh, one of the women said to me, I, I, I called one of the women out. She didn't say she wasn't a believer. I, it was clear. I said, you're not a Christian. You know, why are you here poo-pooing everything that Christianity says in the Bible or whatever? Um, she said, well, I'm close to it. My husband is, is getting me there. And I was like, you're not close to it if you hate everything in the Bible. Um, and you, your husband's telling you you can still love Jesus. That's the problem. Now, I'm sure that husband is ticked at me. Because I was like... You're way far away from Christianity. You're not receiving Christ because Christ is the Bible. If you hate the Bible, you hate Christ. Don't convince yourself that you love him. But I bet her husband is like, man, I almost convinced her. And it's sort of like, convince her of what? That you've trimmed all of this character and all of this theology off of Jesus to make him more palatable so that she receives a fake Jesus? What good is that? Look how Christ conducts his ministry. Does he tippy toe on eggshells around everyone? Oh, uh, I'm just trying to convince you to believe in me. He says things that are offensive in the most offensive way. I'm not saying that everybody should go around and do that. But I think the reason why he does that is to show that those who don't receive me aren't going to receive me regardless of how I say it. And those who receive me will receive me regardless of how I say it. Because it's the spirit of God drawing people, not persuasive words, not us convincing through the flesh. I, I've gotten a lot of pushback for, you know, tone or whatever in the past with this well. Sure. Um, can you speak to maybe some of the, 
like, you know, the stereotypical, you know, guy on the street corner with a bullhorn, Hillsborough Baptist. I mean, let's say they were actually in that same crazy things, but it was just the, the way of presenting. I mean, what would you say to someone who is, I don't know, looking to be a street preacher or a missionary or a pastor, but they, you know, they just, I don't know, like they, they can't publicly speak or they, they just, you know, they're yelling at everybody. Like, there's still, it seems like God I, is I love I love those guys. Here, here's why. Here's why. One, I think they're a judgment on, on uh, the fake Christians all around them, um, which is why you hear a lot of judgment out of them. Now, they, that, they may believe that according to their ideology. I mean, from God's perspective, I think God is showing judgment on everybody around them. Now, two, people are actually saved through them. Um, occasionally, you know. Um, so I, I don't mind them at all. Now, obviously, the guys who don't really get the gospel right or whatever, I, I'm concerned about that. But, um, but I, I don't mind them. Now, would I tell you guys that's how you should probably go out? Probably not. Um, but would I indicate one way or another, either way, if you messed up and you didn't say it just right or you just said it too harshly or whatever, that somehow, oh, no, that person would have been saved, but, oh, no, now they won't? No, absolutely not. That's absolutely false. If that person is the, an elect of God, he's going to be saved through the preaching of the gospel, no matter how great you are at it. It's not you. And this hel is helpful, I think, and maybe this is along the lines of your question, I think this is helpful for you when you want to share the gospel and you feel like, well, I'm not adequate. And it's sort of like, yeah, no one's adequate to do it. No one's going to persuade anyone to become a Christian. So if you're looking like, oh, well, I won't persuade them, yeah, you won't persuade them, and no one else will either. It's God, through the gospel, who persuades. So, know the gospel. Know what it is. But it's not through persuasive words. That's Paul's point. I didn't come to you like this. I came to you with Christ and him crucified. That's what I came to you with. I didn't come to you with some big lecture and a bunch of charts and all of this stuff. I didn't do any of that. I gave you the gospel, and you were saved by it, by the power of God, not by the words. So you can see that clearly. He's saying Jews are looking for signs, mm -hmm. and Greeks are looking for wisdom. Right. But both of them seem like they're to persuade. The wisdom is to Correct. persuade with the words, and the works are to persuade with the actions. Yeah. But neither of them have the gospel and the work of the Holy Spirit. Right. What if, if I persuade someone through... Uh, words and wisdom and things like that. What am I? What am I doing? If I, I'm calling you to faith, but I'm persuading you to where you agree, where you can see it for yourself, is that faith? Isn't that sight? So if you and, and this is true of anything, not just the gospel. I want you to think about this when we teach the word of God to you, and you're like, oh, I don't know about that. I'm going to think about that. It's like, well, are you thinking about it in terms of whether it's scriptural or are you thinking about it whether or not you agree? Because if you're thinking about whether or not you agree, then you're actually saying to God, I will not believe you until I see it myself. Until I can see how that's true through my own reasoning, I will not believe you, God. Now, the Jews are doing a likewise thing. They're actually saying, I need a sign. Why? Because if I have a sign, I can see that it's true. And therefore, don't need to believe God. So either way, it's saying to God, I'm not going to believe you unless I see it myself. And God, for the most part, is going to be like, no. You don't get either one. So if you are persuaded through words, that's going to be a fake Christianity. If you're persuaded through signs, that's going to be a fake Christianity. You've got to be persuaded by basically just the Spirit of God um, uh, regenerating you so that you can receive the word of God, which is offensive to all of us. Now, that brings us to the fact that Paul says the gospel is actually foolish to the world. Um, to the Greeks, it's probably foolish. Is, is, has everybody had like Greek mythology where you've like, I'm not saying that you remember every story, but you can, you can remember like one or two, right? If you've had it like, like, you know, Hercules or, uh, or you know, the stuff with, um, what's his name, Achilles. Um, how do the gods, through a humanity, um, how do they actually overcome evil in those stories? Through violence? 
war. Um, well, sex too, that's true. But, but usually the sex is bound up with cleverness. So cleverness and um, strength. Basically, that, that's how the gods gain victory. Our God became flesh and died on a cross. That sounds stupid to a Greek mind. A God came into the world and he died. That's the opposite of our stories. The stories are the gods come into the world through some demigod and they overcome through cleverness or through strength and war and power and all of that. Now, Paul says, look, there's a wisdom that people don't get, but you have to actually be on the inside to see it. Because ultimately, our God is overthrowing death because death is caused by evil. And all the way back in Genesis, we find out that evil is not something external to where you can just wipe out this group of people and evil's off the earth because God does that with the flood to show us that evil still exists because with Noah's great righteous family, evil pops right back up. Because God says evil is actually inside of the man. So God actually has to wipe out evil from inside the man in order to wipe out death. And the only way he can do that is by becoming human, linking to all of us, killing our sin nature as he dies, giving us a new nature through the Holy Spirit, which is his immortal nature, that resurrects our spirit, so that we become good people and ultimately in the resurrection, completely good, he'll come back and, and remove those other people, but yet we will remain and overcoming evil also then overcomes death. Permanently. Which is not, not anything that the Greek gods ever could do. They, they overcame it temporarily, but not permanently. So his wisdom is genius. In fact, Paul says the foolishness of God, what seems foolishness, is wiser than men. They would do it the Greek way, but God did it that way, which actually overcomes all evil and all death. Now, why do you think people today, you know, they don't necessarily have Greek mythology in the back of our mind. Why do you think people today might think the gospel is foolish? Because a lot of people think the gospel is foolish today. But Why? Well, I, I think it, it's offensive after you explain to them why they need the gospel, but I think the problem is, is that they think it's foolish because they assume something before that. They, they they, what did he die for? I didn't. Right, we're all good people. God loves us all. What, 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 what do you need Jesus to die for? I, I'm, I'm already good. We talk to an atheist. Most atheists, if you're like, what, what if you're wrong? They'll always back up and be like, well, I think I've lived a good life, and so I think if God is just and good, he's going to let me in. And That's the problem. Well, yeah, you don't need a gospel in that context because you're a good person. I guess Jesus doesn't need to die. That's foolish, but that, that sounds dumb. Why, why did Jesus die? It's sort of like, hey, everybody, I've got a, I've got a cure for a simpleton degree, uh, disease. Is everybody happy about that simple end disease? I, I've got a cure for it. That? Yeah, you're right. You're right. It's like it's like there is no such what, what? There's no such disease. Who cares? Of course, you're not excited about it. It's stupid. But if you all had pancreatic cancer, and I suddenly said, "Hey, I've got a cure for pancreatic cancer," I bet everybody'd be really excited. So our culture thinks that the gospel is stupid because it doesn't actually realize that they're going to hell that they actually are under the wrath of God and that their sin has actually taken them to the point where they will die eternally. And now the good news is real good because God has sent a savior into the world to save you. But again, that's foolishness to the world until you get it, until you're on the inside, until you can see it, once you have faith, um, you're, you're not going to see the, the greatness of, of that message. You're not going to see the good news in that news. Is there another way that they can reject um, the historicity of it? So like you have a lot of people that refuse to read anymore. Yeah. And they refuse to read historical things. And so therefore Django Unchained becomes, you know, an accurate portrayal of slavery as opposed to the South as opposed to anything that you could actually read about. Time, right? So, like, they've rejected it, like the cancel culture and the enlightenment.
enlightenment influence on the way that we think. So yeah. not just, I don't have the disease, I don't need the cure. Um, I don't have the disease, and that cure that you think you have is, is fairy tales. It's Santa Claus and um, tooth fairies and things like that. Yeah. I, I actually think that I could... Now, there are historical ways to deal with that. However, I think that that argument itself still has the assumption of we're basically good, so we don't need it. Because most people, unlike, an, uh, unlike atheists, actually do believe God exists. <clears throat> That's all you need for those people. Because if God exists and we find out that we, that we actually have a sin nature that needs to be dealt with, then the only remedy of that would be the cross. And at that point, it's like, well, if God is loving, then that must be true. If God is loving, that must have actually happened because that's what God would have done. And so, I, again, I think that a lot in our culture stems from we're basically good, therefore we don't need that, therefore I can just say it's a myth. Um, now, obviously, there's also historical things too. Yeah, our culture is seriously dumbed down and... I, people don't realize the historical way of arguing for it. They think, again, it's just the same thing as like arguing for Buddha or something that's more mythological. It's, they don't realize it, how rooted in history it is. Um, you understand then, so just to conclude on that, you understand then why we preach the way that we do Um why we don't try to draw people and why you shouldn't get upset. Look, I realize that when you have a loved one coming into the church, you want to make sure people greet them and talk to them. And that's totally fine. That's great. I see those things put up on the side of, Hey, my sister's visiting my mom, my friend, whatever it be or whatever, make sure you, you talk to them. And I think that's good. I just want to make sure that we're reminding people to talk to them because you want maybe the gospel preached but not because you want people to convince them through being nice um, and being hospitable. I want you to be nice and hospitable. Brian said be mean. <laughs> right. Yeah. Give them the raw you, you, you should be nice. You should be hospitable. You should be friendly, right? I mean, I think that's something you should be. But that's not what makes a Christian a Christian. It really is the Spirit of God. And therefore, the things that are received are received because of God. And the things that are not received are not received because of, uh, because of God. And that's why Paul says, why? so no one can boast. No flesh will boast before him. No one will be like, you know what? I became a Christian because that guy just invited me in. People give these stories all the time. That's not why you became a Christian. I'm sorry, like, I, I like Rosario Butterfield, but her whole hospitality thing is nonsense. It's not true. She did not become a Christian because uh, her, her pastor friend invited her in for dinner. That may have been an opportunity to preach the gospel, that's fine, but she became a Christian because of the gospel that was given to her, whether he ever invited her in or not. He could have said it out on the street, and God would have actually, through that, saved her. The difference is, is that the elect will become regenerate and God will use those who are faithful in right. preaching the word, not, not those who are hospitable and really, really nice people and super eloquent with their words and just really politically correct. Right. So because someone else will teach them. Someone else will give her the gospel and she will become regenerate. Yeah, it's a matter of whether or not you're going to be the one as the catalyst to tell her the gospel, but you're not persuading her. If you're persuading her, you're persuading her flesh. The flesh can be persuaded. You can make false Christians. It happens all the time. I think secret sensitive churches are filled with them, which is why then you give them the actual word of God, which is Jesus, and they are repulsed by it. Yeah, they hate, they hate Jesus. But in their heads, they love him because, oh, yeah, Jesus is that guy who, who basically tells me all this loving stuff that's great. And um, so, yeah, of course I love Jesus. And then you present Jesus from the law or something, you know, Jesus, you know, through Elijah killed a bunch of teenagers with bears. Uh, you like that, Jesus? Jesus killed the Canaanite children because basically they were not of him and they're in his land and they would have grown up to kill his uh, children. So he killed them. 
Do you love that, Jesus? I do, because I've been regenerated. In my rebellion, though, I wouldn't have loved him. And the problem is, is these people are not regenerate. They're not, they've not become Christians through the actual gospel and the word of God. They've become Christians through human persuasion. And we have adopted not the philosophy that Paul is giving us here from the word of God, but the philosophy of sophism, to where we're just looking to convince people in any means possible to make them Christians. And all we're doing is we're just creating more problems in the church because now we have a bunch of people who are of the, of the mind of the flesh dictating what we do in church. All we have is a bunch of false Christians now constantly getting in the way, giving us bad advice, unbiblical advice, and poo-pooing the actual advice in the word of God. Yeah. Uh, well, what he's actually doing is he's simply using language to communicate the gospel. So he's real clear on that, right? So he's actually using what they're familiar with the, to communicate the gospel to them. He's not trimming things off of Jesus to make Jesus more palatable. He's not trying to persuade them in a way that actually is not the gospel itself. And so he's taking their religious ideas, uh, language they're familiar with, and he's communicating the gospel through that. And I think that's, that's a really important distinction that a lot of people don't make with that sort of thing. He's looking to, look, how can I communicate the gospel to this person using their language? Versus, how can I persuade with my language, how do, can I persuade this person to, you know, generically kind of become a Christian? That's just a very different thing. But Brian, don't we want to be winsome? <laughs> Well, it also shows that maybe we should be more simple when we teach. I mean, it's hard for, it's hard for us when we, you know, we're, we're educated to a certain degree. You know, words fly out of my mouth. I don't pay attention. I try to make things simple. Um, but maybe it's not about speaking, like, way up here. It's, it's actually just communicating the simplicity of the truth and seeing what God does with it. I, I made this decision a long time ago when I started preaching at my former church because I wanted, to, I wanted to see myself, frankly. I wanted to see if, if, if this is true, God's going to work through simple message. When, when you grow, go into seminary or you go into uh, Bible school, you take homiletics courses, and you are taught to start out with a story that connects with your audience or a joke or something of that nature, and then you kind of read the passage, and then you give a bunch of illustrations, point one, point two, and it's all about persuasion in that manner. And I was like, you know what? Forget all that. I'm not going to do that. I'm just going to read this text, and I'm going to explain what it says, and then I'm going to apply it where I think it applies today. Well, some of it can be about clarity, though, too. Like if it's, can, like if it's not ordered. Right. Order. No, yeah, it, it should be about clarity. Yeah. But, but ultimately, um, I think it's more about persuasion than clarity because ultimately it ends up trimming a bunch of stuff off what's said in order to make you know a more satisfying, you know, satisfying message. But you can take all those homilies <clears throat> that you just talked about and actually do them the right way too. Right, but my point is that you're not persuading through the homiletics. Right. So my only point would be is that if, if it's for clarity, great. Yeah. If it's for, for persuasion, that's the problem. And so I was, I threw all that out. I saw God change that church like crazy. Um, in a way that he had never done through anything I had taught or preached before the other way. Because I was like, I'm not going to try to persuade. I'm going to see what God does, and we'll see what happens. And it was amazing to see the transformation in people's lives, um, what God did uh, there. So I just, for me, this is how we should preach. This is what we should uh, rest on. We shouldn't actually be looking to become great orators or something, uh, thinking that's going to persuade. We should simply look to be simple and clear in what we say and watch God work. Would you say that uh, someone who's converted then, one of the primary evidences that would be their relationship then? 
Yeah. This is why I say, look, uh, you may not be a spiritual giant, but if you have the spirit of God in you, then you should be teachable to the word of God. That's the biggest sign to me. If you really want to look like what what is what is the beginning of spirituality, I think that's it. I think being teachable to the word of God. When you have people who just don't want to hear the word of God, that's a massive problem. I like I, I have to say that either that's immaturity or it's a sign of just not being regenerate. Because as Paul says here, what the spirit of God, you have the mind of Christ, you have the spirit of God, so you're going to receive the things of the spirit. If you don't have the spirit of God, you're not going to receive the things of the spirit. You're just going to receive whatever you're accustomed to that happens to maybe be in the Bible too, but you're not going to receive those things that, that aren't normative to you already. Right. Like that's that's the connection here. Yeah. Um, is how how far would you go to? Uh, no, nah, maybe not. How far would you go? How far would you allow other Christians to go before you say that you've actually encroached on this prohibition? That you've actually violated this, and you don't believe that God's the one who saved you. This is a spread. I think it's an intention issue. <laughs> Um, so I don't think it's, I don't know if I can identify it with what someone was doing because a lot of it would be clarity. Now I would say that like, if you're using really big words that lack clarity to most people, I think what you're doing is wrong. Um, so I, I, I think that's the problem. I, to me, it's a matter of, are you clearly communicating what God is, wants to say to these people and then letting God work with that? Or are you trying to show that you're smart? Um, because that's, that's again, this is about, so man doesn't boast. I would say, man, that's a lot of boasting that you would have then. Um, <clears throat> so it really is an, intention, an intentionality issue. Yeah. Anything else? Yeah. So, like over and over, he's saying we're preaching Christ crucified, Christ resurrected. Like, right. That's it. Yeah. Um, it's not about you. Right? I think that's. If there's a way maybe that we tended to try to persuade, is that we turn the gospel from an objective gospel that I would say the exact same gospel to, to everyone. Mm, right. To like tailoring my message in some sort of. How this? I'm, I'm talking to a white thirty-year-old divorced male, and now I got to tailor everything. Right. And this is the How this benefits you, right? right. And, and I think Paul's. A, I mean, he does what he does on Mars Hill, but it's still an objective. The, the right. ending is still objective. Yeah, it's, it's not, is Christ crucified and resurrected? Right. Yeah. Right. It's not, and I think we tailor the gospel so specifically and make it right up front about how. You know, Christ can give you a person standing in front of me forgiveness of sins and peace and how, you know, what's been wrong in your life, what are the challenges that you've gone through. And here's right. Jesus can fix them. That's yeah. the gospel oftentimes. Instead of like, what Paul's preaching is, it's the same for everyone. And if it's the same for everyone, right. then you're not personally pleasing because you have a tailored message. Well, when, when you're a sophist, you want to tailor it to the person because you're trying to persuade. Um them to adopt something so it is about jesus can really help you out and you know you're stressed with life jesus can help your stress out right. um you're well you're kind of you don't have your finances together well jesus can help you with that that's what the sophists would teach right they would say right. Uh, evaluate the person the audience right and then tell and then they would teach you how to right so and and you can bring them to a position you want in that way um yeah unfortunately that is the majority of preaching in the more popular churches and it works again it works if you want fake Christians. You get a lot of them. They'll come like the sands of the seashore. But again, talking to those people day and night, when you present actual Jesus to them, they hate him. So what did you really accomplish? But basically deceive all these people into thinking that they're Christians when they're not. What about the, what about the, the homiletic that actually says, okay, you're going to teach, but then everything has to come back to Christ and be crucified. So they always bring it back to how it's connected 
to the cross. Yeah, have you heard this? So, like, I know Covenant Seminary teaches that in yeah. Missouri, and I think there's other seminaries that teach similar homiletics where everything has to crescendo, not just Christocentricity, but it has to crescendo at Christ and the cross, and that's all I know. That's just, you know what I'm saying? So, like, it's almost like an overemphasis, like, coming back to this uh, without doing it in a natural way that that might be a different issue i i think that um that might be due to one's view of like law and gospel and it might have to do with um the fact that we we are in a tradition that is heavily revivalistic and therefore views the church as needing a some gospel call at the end um uh but even for believers just uh, the idea that you need to kind of end with a <clears throat> some uh bringing it to Christ so that they aren't aren't weighted down by the law that you preached or something of that nature. I don't have a problem with that. I mean, I think it's fine. Uh, I probably have more of a problem with a revivalistic altar call type thing where, well, this is about unbelievers here and therefore you're only going to hear this message over and over again. Well, some of them believe that you're actually wrong. So, like, right. that's, that's the issue that we ran. And that was in a PCA church, too. Yeah, I mean, I would just be like, can you establish that biblically and, yeah. you know. <laughs> they would try to go here, but yeah, I mean, I, I mean, like you know, does James do that right. in James, and or does Matthew? Do, I mean, I just feel like you know, they, it's not necessary, but I don't have a problem with people doing it, I guess. But I wouldn't, I wouldn't say it's necessary. It's necessary to have the gospel message in people's minds if they're un, if they're you know, unaware of the gospel. Then yeah, we should probably make that known. But again, it just, I don't think it's necessary every single time. Anything else? <laughs> well, we're already uh, like 40 minutes in. All right, let's go ahead and uh, bow a word of prayer. Uh, Brent, you want to pray for us? Thanks, guys.